Good morning, everyone. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my honor to welcome you all to the second annual High Level Women, Peace, and Leadership Symposium, Implementing Transformative Action, Prioritizing the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda in a Time of Pandemic, co-hosted with the Government of Sweden, a longtime and treasured partner of IPI. Uh, allow me to take the moment to thank the government of Sweden, uh, including the permanent mission of Sweden to the United Nations for their support and friendship and to Foreign Minister Amanda, who is here. Uh, this discussion forms part of our Women, Peace and Leadership project organized in partnership with Sweden to provide opportunities for senior decision makers to have frank and focused discussions on how to solve pressing issues. It follows two earlier discussions this year on how states can best support women's participation in peace building during uh, the pandemic. On May 27th, IPI organized with Sweden a closed door ministerial level discussion on women, peace and leadership to discuss specific actions states can take to support the participation of women in conflict prevention and peace building. Participants at that ministerial level discussion raised a number of central considerations needed to build transformative peace in a time of pandemic and noted potential solutions and strategies to address these issues. This was then followed up for further discussion uh, by an ambassadorial level roundtable in July, which provided key inputs into an action oriented issue brief, which IPI published yesterday. It is available on our website and I, and I recommend it. Um, there are some excellent concrete recommendations there entitled Peace Building During a Pandemic, Keeping the Focus on Women's Inclusion. This forum then looks to take the next steps to identify concrete strategies to follow up on this work with a focus on implementation, ownership, and innovative partnerships to safeguard women's participation in peace processes and peace building amid COVID-19 and beyond and to advance the goals of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda during this very critical anniversary year. It is uh, an ambitious agenda, but one would expect nothing less from the great group that we have assembled uh, in our virtual room here today. Um, I will briefly introduce the speakers and then we will go straight to it. First, we will hear from our co-host, uh, Her Excellency Miss Anne Linda, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, Next, we will hear from Her Excellency Ms. Rosemary DiCarlo, Undersecretary General for the United Nations Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Then, His Excellency Mr. Alvin Boats, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of South Africa, followed by Her Excellency Ms. Martha Delgado, Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Then, Ms. Omat Al Alim Al Baswa, former Minister for Human Rights in Yemen, followed by Ms. Sanam Naraji Anderlini, founder and CEO of International Civil Society Action Network, many of you know that by ICON, and director of the LSE Center for Women, Peace and Security. You can see we have tremendous experience, expertise and leadership at this table, uh, much to discuss in uh, just about an hour. So with that, for Ms. Linda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, friends, and distinguished audience, the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a health crisis with socioeconomic and humanitarian consequences, it's also a risk aggravating conflict dynamics. Therefore, our joint efforts to prevent conflict must be strengthened despite challenging circumstances. Diplomacy and dialogue are needed more than ever in the international response to the pandemic and in our efforts towards sustaining peace, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is crucial. I therefore thank you for joining this important discussion today. I would also like to thank IPI for our cooperation since a long time and for organizing this meeting. Over the past few months, I have had a chance to speak to several of you on the topic of women, peace and security during the pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis has underlined the urgency of moving forward. It has also underlined how useful the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is 
to deal with complex crises. From conversation with women peace builders, with fellow ministers of foreign affairs, and with representatives of even international organization, I have drawn the following conclusions. Leadership is always tested in a crisis situation. This is even more true on issues relating to inclusion. To prioritize women, peace and security, there is a need for strong leadership from governments. Where a crisis moves in, inclusion often moves out. But there is no law of nature governing this. During our two-year term, uh, two term in the United Nations Security Council, we managed to include references to the situation of women in close to all Council statements on different crises. There is a choice to be made between letting the pandemic become a moment of moving backward or moving forward. As the Deputy Secretary and Lamina Mohammed rightly said earlier this year, we have two choices. We can lose the gains of the last decades, or we can emerge more resilient, equal, and inclusive. We now lay the ground for a new way of thinking of peace building where women's participation is a must. Women's economic empowerment is intrinsically linked to women's participation. Meetings with women from Yemen and Syria this summer underline this fact. We will, as leaders of Action Coalition with South Africa, look at the intersection between women, peace and security and economic empowerment of women. Women's organization rose to the challenge of a virus threatening societies as well as their own peace work and quickly step into the support of humanitarian aid flow, spread information and find new ways of connecting. Their works need to be recognized as the community resilience fabrics it is. Their work also need to be connected to the highest decision-making levels. Women's civil society briefers should brief the Security Council and other decision-making bodies on country-specific matters, as well as issues related to other security threats, such as terrorism and climate change. There is no need for the pandemic to be used as an excuse to decrease this participation. The virtual format is an enabling factor. We can do better. The pandemic has shown how the world can quickly adapt and change to a new reality. In 2020, we learned how changes come fast if needed. Women's participation is needed. It should come fast. Political will at all levels can make this happen. Women's participation can transform societies. In Belarus, we have seen how women have been in the forefront of the democratic demonstrations. I'm appalled by continued arbitrary arrests and forced exile of opposition representative in the country. But I am inspired by the women leading the way. This year's United Nations General Assembly is taking place during exceptional circumstances. COVID-19 and challenges that follow in its footsteps have illustrated the need for strong multilateral cooperation and common solutions. The fact that the United Nations will turn 75 this year is an opportunity to push for a stronger and more effective United Nations that is equipped to address contemporary and future challenges. This also offers an opportunity to effectively address women's participation in peace building. We also need the involvement of other international bodies. As the incoming chairperson of OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, I see women, peace and security as an important element in our work to strengthen common security within the framework of the European security order, linked to the OSCE concept of comprehensive security. Finally, we must all work together to overcome destructive negative gender stereotypes 
not only to guarantee the full and effective participation of women in conflict prevention and peace building, but also to protect women and girls from sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll go straight uh, to um, Under Secretary General Rosemary DiCarlo, who I know is on a tight schedule. Please. Uh, Rosemary, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lupil. I'm really pleased to be joining you today. And I'd like to extend my thanks to Sweden, especially Minister Lind uh, and uh, the International Peace Institute for organizing this event. Um, in the last few months, the disruptive force of COVID-19 has impacted all of us. It has caused unimaginable loss and suffering, challenged our assumptions about how we live and work, and overshadowed so many of our global priorities, including this year's 20th anniversary year of Security Council Resolution 1325. As the minister said, while the pandemic is primarily considered a health crisis, it has had significant impact on our socioeconomic well being and on peace and security. And many of the economic costs of the pandemic are disproportionately affecting women who are overrepresented in some of the sectors hardest hit by shutdowns and ensuing layoffs and cuts. And gender based violence, particularly in the home, surged around the world as COVID 19 lockdowns became necessary. <clears throat> Social unrest erupted in some areas <clears throat> because of deteriorating economic conditions <clears throat> and parties to conflict at times used the chaos and uncertainty created by the virus to press their advantage. And during this difficult period, our ability to con conduct conflict prevention and conflict resolution initiatives has been limited by travel restrictions. More than ever, we need to make sure that women's voices are heard in crafting the response to the pandemic and in building a more peaceful world. I'd like to highlight three priority areas for consideration. First, the use of digital technology. As travel restrictions have slowed peace talks or moved them online, we've taken steps to ensure women's leadership continues in the virtual world. The Special Envoy for Syria and the Special Representative for Colombia are using digital platforms to consult regularly with women groups, advisory boards and mediator networks. In Yemen, our special envoy leveraged the power of digital technologies to conduct large scale virtual consultations with over 500 Yemenis, including many Yemeni women's networks. We see the enormous potential for digital tools to open closed spaces, increase the transparency of power sharing and facilitate the safe and diverse participation of women in peacemaking. We've been able to engage more women than ever in peacemaking activities through digital technologies over the last few months. However, it remains the case that virtual spaces mirror the inequalities that exist in the offline world. Women and girls in conflict effect settings often lack equal access to technology and are subjected to online harassment and intimidation that can have real world consequences for their safety. And supporting access to technology and combating online bullying must therefore be prioritized as fundamental to ensuring women's participation in public and political life. Second issue, second area I'd like to highlight is resourcing. Effectively implementing the Women, Peace and Security agenda requires dedicated and predictable capacity and funding. My department has allocated 17% of our extra budgetary resources to projects supporting women, peace and security. We've also created a gender marker to track the mainstreaming of gender issues in all of our initiatives. And the UN Peace Building Fund has over the last two years allocated 40% of its total investments to gender responsive peace building. Allocating adequate, predictable and sustained financing must be a joint priority for all of us to achieve the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Finally, we must be more vocal and active in our support for women. In an environment of shrinking civic space and backlash against women's rights, it's incumbent on the international community to, and I will quote Secretary General Antonio Guterres in this, push back against the pushback. We must harness the current interruption to the status quo 
to build more inclusive prevention, peacemaking, and governance structures. We need to build back better. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Very clear to, to lay out those three priorities, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to some of those during the discussion. But I think we will, uh, to keep on time, we're going to keep moving forward and move to uh, uh, His Excellency Mr. Alvin Boats, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of South Africa. Mr. Boats, please, the floor is yours. Uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Lupel, the Vice President of the International Peace Institute, Minister Anne Lin of Sweden, our calls, uh, colleagues. I would like to thank the International Peace Institute and the government of Sweden for organizing this symposium. Your stewardship in the international realm is deeply being appreciated. At the out outset, it is present to recognize that although progress has been slow in implementing the aspirations of resolution, 1325, some progress has been made to advance women, peace, and security agenda. However, colleagues, it goes without saying that more still needs to be done to fully implement the provisions of Resolution 1325. We need to remove barriers that continue to prevent meaningful progress towards the full implementation of the women, peace, and security agenda, regardless of a well-established normative framework. South Africa recognized this challenge and thus we champion the UN Security Council Resolution 2493 in October 2019, in which we urge the full implementation of all commitments made on human peace and security. Colleagues, the current prevailing global situation triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic had has evidently added a new dimension to the advancement of this noble objective. The questions that we should ask ourselves is how do we proceed with achieving this very noble goal amidst a global pandemic, which has not only exposed, but deepened the structural inequalities between men and women from the health to the economy, from security to social protection, and in the main, the diversion of much needed resources from many peace processes to deal with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Program director, we can see that the virus has provided us with an alternative on the future of work. In addition to your normal physical meetings, interactions can take place virtually like what we are doing right now. However, proper ICT infrastructure and facilities must be made available for women to participate in these type of meetings, such as the negotiation and mediation processes. We must be convinced that the issues of safety for such interaction, noting that some states do censor or limit interaction between its citizens and the outside world. However, we must be very cautious not to exclude human in physical interaction by using virtual interactions. Virtual interactions colleagues have the advantage of allowing high number of participants instead of only a select few that normally would have been the case when traveling to meeting venues is involved. That is evidenced by the high participation in virtual meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore it is our submission in South Africa that the pandemic presents an opportunity to broaden participation of women peace builders. Colleagues, uh, the issue of financing women peace and security activities remains critical for South Africa. States, regional organizations, and relevant international organizations can and should play a greater role in securing financial resources to support inclusive peace processes and for women involvement in peace building during and beyond the pandemic. The allocation therefore program director of a certain percentage of the official development assistance directed to conflict affected countries to gender equality and human empowered programs, which include human peace and security activities should be maintained and encouraged during and beyond the pandemic. Similarly, a certain percentage of funding for peace building activities undertaken by the UN Peace Building Fund should be dedicated to women peace and security act 
activities. And it is our recommendations that these should be aligned to the national action plans or equivalent frameworks, which must be accompanied by dedicated budgets. In terms of leadership of women, evidence provides that women are in the forefront of dealing with the challenges faced by women during the COVID-19 pandemic. They are the majority in the health sector and informal economy. At the same time, however, few has been included in national COVID-19 response plans. Colleagues, it has unfortunately been reported that during the COVID-19 pandemic, more women and girls have been subjected to gender-based violence. This vulnerability was identified by women activists and also by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who called for a national COVID-19 response plan to address gender-based violence. It is therefore critically important that women and girls in conflict-affected situations and frail situations up, uh, who are prone to gender-based violence are provided therefore with the necessary assistance, particularly sexual and reproductive health services. It is critically equally so that peace processes continue to include active participation of women at all levels, colleagues. The leadership of women could and should further be strengthened by regional and global networks, coordinating efforts, sharing of experiences and best practices. Looking ahead, and in terms of the commitments for practical implementation as we begin the 75th session of UNGA and beyond, South Africa wished to see the following. Firstly, the continuation of the commemoration of the anniversaries of the Beijing Platform for Action and Resolution 1325 into 2021. Secondly, the implementation of targeted and achievable quotas for women representation and participation across the peace continent. Thirdly, the intergenerational interaction with more involvement of young women within the peace dialogue. Fourthly, the finding of solutions regarding the sustainability of the resourcing financially of uh, this very noble intent. Fifthly, colleagues, enhancement of partnership between governments and non-state actors, in particular women uh, NGOs. Lastly, colleagues, uh, we, we are obviously looking at supporting undertaking of more research on the impact of the global nature of health pandemics on human, on the human peace and security agenda. As I conclude, uh, we reiterate as South Africa uh, that any transformation uh, approach requires strengthened monitoring, evaluation and coordinating measures in implementing this very noble uh, agenda. Thank you very much, Program Director. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Minister. Very, uh, very detailed and concrete uh, proposals there. Much, much appreciated and really is sort of what we're, we're looking for in this forum. So uh, thank you so much for that. We'll discuss it further uh, in a moment. Uh, but now we will move on to uh, Her Excellency Ms. Marta Delgado, Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mexico. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Anlin, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, dear colleagues. Um, on behalf of the government of Mexico City, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the Minister and Linde and the International Peace Institute for convening this timely high level virtual symposium. Mexico firmly believes that effective multilateralism represents the best means for addressing common challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unfortunate example of the need to revitalize multilateral cooperation and explore new avenues of collaboration in order to achieve common goals and tackle global climate change and global challenge, such, such as ensuring the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda also. The this is why Mexico presented the UN General Assembly Resolution 74274 on international cooperation to ensure global access to the medicines, vaccines, and medical equipment needed to combat a COVID-19 pandemic, endorsed by 179 countries and unanimously adopted in April 21st. This resolution calls 
for synergies between various UN agencies to help member states to address effectively the pandemic with the conviction to strengthen multilateral system. Uh, as the global COVID-19 pandemic spreads, the most vulnerable, including women and children, pay the highest price during the conflict and post-conflict settings. Likewise, the government of Mexico supports the UN Secretary General's call for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world. And well, uh, as his uh, call for immediate global action to end all forms of violence against women and girls, in the midst of the pandemic and to implement effectively the women, peace and security agenda through this period. In this context, we also reaffirm that the Security Council resolution to two women, peace and security was one of the first council resolutions that recognize health pandemics as part of the peace and security landscape. This resolution also highlights the importance of prevention, protection, and equal participation and leadership of women to be part of all responses. In 2020, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of the Security Council Resolutions 3025. Instead, we spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, even the limited gains made in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back. According to the UN, the pandemic poses devastating risks for women and girls in fragile and uh, conflict-affected contexts uh, where social uh, cohesion is already undermined and institutional capacity and services are limited. Besides concerning lack of equal access of women and girls to healthcare, including sexual and reproductive healthcare services, social services, education, and other critical support. There's a need for specific gender responsive policies to provide and enhance protection for all women, including against domestic, intimate partner and gender-based violence. In the context of the 25th uh, anniversary of the Beijing platform and the, and the platform for action on the Generation Equality Forum, which is coordinated by Mexico and also by France in 2021, we welcome the inclusion of the Women, Peace and Security Compact as one of the six compacts of the Generation Equality Forum. The Generation Equality Forum is critical to integrate an intergenerational approach to tackle discriminatory barriers that prevent women's equal participation in international peace and security and humanitarian efforts, and to promote the work of women peace builders and women human rights defenders, as, as well uh, to ensure women's leadership in all peace and security and humanitarian decision-making processes. Uh, elevate commitments, coordination, and partnerships for the 20 anniversary resolution of uh, 3025 is very important right now. Also implement public campaigns in conflict and post-conflict settings to raise awareness on this proportionate impact of the pandemic of COVID-19 on women and girls, which the UN Department of Peace Operations could coordinate. Uh, 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 finally, I will further elaborate on the subject during the debate. Let me take a few minutes to share that we are doing right now at the national level in Mexico. We have adopted a feminist foreign policy and also we are participating in the women's peace building, building program. So uh, right now, uh, the new the new government, which is uh, in, in, in the chair uh, for two years, uh, is putting very, very much attention on the women matters. And we are going to raise awareness on this agenda during the next uh, UN uh, 75th anniversary. Uh, we will continue to participate in the group of Friends of Women, Peace and Security, and also in the global network of focal points on women, peace and security to share experience lessons and promoting joint international efforts to advance the implementation of the agenda. Finally, I, need, I think that we need to recover from the current pandemic uh, with a renewed commitment not to leave anyone behind and to fully realize that we need a more integrated, multi-sectoral and gender transformative approach 
to conflict prevention and resolutions and sustaining peace, in which the leadership of, of women is a reality and not just an aspiration. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, uh, in particular, uh, for beginning and, and threading throughout this uh, very important point of that this raises, this whole issue raises the uh, highlights, the need that we need to come together and revitalize our multilateral cooperation, both in response uh, to the pandemic and uh, in support of the peace and security agenda. This is uh, an issue, of course, that is core to IPI's mandate. Um, very good. We'll move uh, straight on as time, time is, is short. And we'll next hear from Ms. Ahmad Al Alim Al Soswa, former Minister for, for, uh, for Human Rights in Yemen. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to join the esteemed speakers by thanking the Minister of uh, Swedish, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Sweden, and also the IPI for this wonderful initiative. And uh, glad to be talking here with also uh, and amongst this wonderful, really group of experts and also practitioners and quite truly uh, champions, if you will, of women, peace and security agenda. COVID-19 pandemic does not spare anyone, but has the worst also impact on women and others who are not adequately represented, especially who are not really, or who are in the armed conflict countries. Last March, the UN Secretary General called a nationwide ceasefire to immediately return to peace talk and join efforts to prevent the spread of COVID-19. These efforts failed, unfortunately, to pressure all the local Yemeni parties to pressure them to end the conflict. And the violence, unfortunately, has increased while COVID continues also to spread and detected, under-tested, and also under-reported. Internationally, we need to ask ourselves if there is a real serious political will to further peace building and meet challenges of COVID-19 while committing ourselves as well to women's participation. Unfortunately, regional and international interventions have not contributed significantly to peace, and the result has been the world's worst humanitarian crisis added to a crisis of accountability. Here I'm talking about the Yemeni context. In 2015, the Office of the Special Envoy to the Secretary General and the UN Woman established the Yemeni Women's Pact for Peace and Security. That included so many women networks. In March 2018, to facilitate the new Special Envoy's task, 146 Yemeni women leaders submitted a summary of relevant issues and peace building recommendations. To date, most of these have not been meaningfully addressed. Both the pandemic and peace building require that national efforts be carried out in tandem with local and community-based approaches. International organizations must tailor interventions to the perceived needs of the diverse women's networks in each country. External interventions cannot succeed independently of strong local input, and the most sustainable policies and interventions must be initiated and implemented by local women and men. I here underline also the word of men. Yemeni women have been active local mediators throughout the conflict. And in response to COVID-19, women have worked through village, municipal councils, and the private sector to manufacture and distribute, to distribute PPEs, masks, and protective clothing to medical staff and the public. They have negotiated also the release of prisoners from detention centers to reduce the spread of infection. Women doctors and nurses have been amongst the first responders at the peak of the pandemic. Young women entrepreneurs continue to be active participants. These efforts all were not initiated top down. As we begin the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly, I would like to see a sincere commitment by 
all UN system to assist in reestablishing peace and stability, implement its relevant resolutions in support of women's participation, and at the same time, to commit to involving local communities, trusting them in regards to peace building, especially to articulate their needs and priorities with regard to this important process. Although the Secretary General's current special envoy has pursued negotiations with dedications and sincerity, the well-established standards for women, peace, and security with respect of building sustainable peace have been given no more than, unfortunately, pro forma attention. This is unfortunately a common trend and pattern. It's not only related to the peace uh, process in Yemen. UN envoys mandates need to clearly include women in peace negotiations. It is not enough to give a voice to women, often after considerable additional pressure, unless they have the right and also they can vote. Excluding women because one or more of the warring parties refuses to accept the woman's presence is unacceptable. That's unfortunate. I mean, uh, what I would just say before, before we move on, and hopefully she can she can hear me, is I mean, uh, is really grateful for the perspective from Yemen because Yemen really women peace builders in Yemen are really a case example of why women peace builders are so important. And she raises a number of issues, in turn, including yeah, um, are we, yeah. Um, and I would just note that the the uh, issue brief that we published. Uh, yesterday has a case study on uh, women peace builders in Yemen, which could add uh, further further context to uh, her remarks, and hopefully we'll get her back for the discussion. Um, but for now, just keep things uh, moving. We will turn to uh, Sanam Naraji Andalini, founder and CEO of uh, of ICANN and director of LSC Center for Women, Peace, and Security. Sanam, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning from Washington, D.C. Thank you, IPI. Thank you to, uh, to Minister Lind and, and others for inviting me. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase. Uh, you've all mentioned what the problems are and what the difficulties are, and I'm very grateful to Amat for actually shifting the conversation towards really what women on the ground are doing and how some of the problems, unfortunately, are still lying with the fact that our international partners um, are the ones who are really not doing all that they can to ensure the inclusion of uh, and representation of women. I wanted to uh, uh, keep my remarks to what, what our experience has been and a few recommendations of what needs to be done. When COVID hit, I can, um, uh, given that we run the Alliance for Women's Leadership, uh, security leadership in 40 countries, we started doing weekly calls with our partners in March. We now have every week we've had, we've had the entire Security Council come and talk to us. So it's been very much a direct contact between very, very local people from Libya all the way to, to the Philippines and, and, and Colombia every week with uh, international actors. We also very, um, we're also very grateful to our, to our donor partners, the uh, Canadian government, the Swedish government and others for allowing us to provide flexible funding this year for our partners. We run the Innovative Peace Fund, we do independent small grants and medium-sized grants to our partners, and we, and we were allowed to do flexible funding because of COVID. The number of stories that we have of the impact that giving money to peace builders who then have done COVID work and the implications of that for local peace are tremendous. And I, we don't have time, I'm happy to share with you later. But again, I wanna bring, bring it back to the story of Yemen since, since that's been the theme. Um, our Yemeni peace builder partners have been at work. We helped them with uh, issuing statements about ceasefires. The funding that we gave them helped them do PPE work, helped them set up and fix water stations. The WHO was telling people to, to wash their hands with soap and water. In most of the countries, we have partners where there's war. People were saying we have neither soap nor water. The grants that we gave enabled our partners to do this and, and be present locally. They were doing food bags, they were dealing with domestic violence, all the kinds of issues that you're talking about. Women peace builders were the first ones to respond on the ground and be present. As a result of that, we've seen a number of things. Number one, because they stick their necks out and because they are taking, running to the problem and trying to deal with every, every, everybody's issues, 
they've also been threatened. And, and this is really an important issue that we need recognition, not just of any women, for this particular incidence and for these particular issues of going to the peace, peace table. We need recognition of women who have the courage to become peace builders. They are a very unique community of people. They run to the problem when others are running away. They, they are the bridge, they are interlocutors, they are trusted. And at the same time, they are the ones who are threatened because they hold armed actors accountable. They hold governments accountable. They represent the voice of communities and people and marginalized sectors of society, which I'm sorry, neither governments who are bombing their own people nor armed groups that are bombing their own people do. They, so in a sense, women peace builders have taken on the responsibility to protect without having the power of the gun or having the power of the political elite. They need to be recognized as actors in conflicts and as independent delegations as peace tables. We need to ensure that. I think that's the next step of where we need to go. We need to recognize that the local work is really essential. And the grants that we give range from $3,000 to $80,000. These are not big amounts of money, but they make a huge amount of difference. And frankly speaking, between the COVID-19 issues and what happened in Lebanon with the Beirut explosion, over and over we see that local, local actors respond the international community coming, comes in and actually does harm and doesn't get the resources to them. So we need to shift that balance. The balance has to go to local resilience, local organizations at the right time through the different mechanisms that, 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 that exist. And we have the examples of this. In terms of moving forward with this agenda, specifically with peace talks, um, here are four things that, that our, my network and our community is, is, is talking about. One, independent women peace builder delegations to peace talks. Let them be at the table talking about the issues, bringing in the voices of the communities and so on. If, if, if there's so much resistance from the other actors to having them as an independent delegation, invite them to brief those actors as they did in Colombia. C coming in, talking right now with the, with the Afghan peace talks. Let's have women go in and talk to them about what ceasefires mean, what an inclusive gender responsive ceasefire actually means. Bring them, talk about all the issues, and, and let the del other belligerent actors be responsive to them. Thirdly, let's have separate negotiations. Bring the women peace builders and let them negotiate the issues. This is what um, President Mandela and President Nyerere did for Burundian women back in the early 2000s. And let the women show the armed actors what it looks like. It actually pushes them. It creates a competition around finding solutions. And finally, as the international community, given that we know that 50% of of exclusive peace processes fail, we should be now taking a united front and saying, unless the peace building community of a country supports the peace agreement that's been signed, we from the international side should not be putting good money after that. We should not be enabling warring parties, kleptocratic regimes to further their own gains without actually bearing responsibility for protecting and for caring about their communities and all of their populations. We have to shift the balance. We cannot continue in this way by basically um, rewarding violence and violent actors. We have to recognize and value our peace actors from a very local level all the way to the, to the, to the international level. We have the networks, we know who they are, um, we, we can present them, we, that they, we can make sure that they have direct contact with you. It's really about a shift away from 20th century systems of very exclusive peacemaking to recognizing that for the 21st century, we need inclusive processes and we need to recognize the peace builders who are risking their own lives for the betterment of their societies. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much. We really, uh, um, we need to shift the balance, as I will just repeat that, uh, that statement right there. Extremely, extremely important insights there. Um, we have only about 10 minutes left, but we do have one uh, intervention uh, from our virtual floor and then a couple of questions from our uh, uh, international audience. And so I'll turn right now to our intervention from the floor from Kavya Soka, Executive Director of the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. Please, Kavya, the floor is your, your question. Thank you so much, Adam. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with you all, and thank you for your excellent interventions. There's so much to think about, and so much that I agree with that I've heard from all of you today. Um, so before the pandemic, we knew that despite all 10 WPS resolutions emphasizing women's rights and their full, equal, meaningful participation, 
seven out of 10 peace processes ex still exclude women and only about 14 to 22% of peace agreements actually contain gender provisions. Uh, I think our, our most articulate intervention from Ms. Ahmad al Soswa was extremely compelling and she raises a lot of very important points that I think we need to engage with, which is that we're continuing to hear the same arguments to justify women's exclusion that women's participation will destabilize already precarious processes, that what matters is stopping the fighting and saving lives. And the pandemic, despite uh, the opportunities many of you have highlighted, uh, has become another excuse to exclude women yet again. So my question to the panelists, uh, keeping in mind what Ms. Amat raised, which I think is so important, we are facing a crisis of political will, as well as a crisis of accountability. Um, so how do we translate these rhetorical commitments that we've heard from the international community over a period of 20 years um, and translate that into real and concrete action? We've heard of technical solutions like, you know, including women through virtual spaces and so on. But the fact is that what we actually need are political solutions to address this core problem of women's participation that we continue to confront 20 years since the adoption of 1325. We, as the NGO Working Group, propose making the direct and formal participation of women a requirement in all UN-supported peace processes. Would our panelists, particularly our former, current, and incoming members of the UN Security Council, Sweden, South Africa, Mexico, support that? And how are you planning to champion women's participation in formal spaces? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Very direct uh, pointed question there. I think so. We've got very limited time. So what I think I want to do is I want to just briefly uh, put on the table two, uh, two uh, further remarks Then I'm going to go to Amat uh, right away. And one of them actually, I think, uh, responds really to her. And then each one, uh, I think, will go in, in sort of reverse order um, for responses and final questions. The first question is, is and this relates really to Amat's point, is from Tabitha Mwangi, a fellow from the African Leadership Center from Kenya. And she asked, frankly, what, what, what's the role of the private sector? How do we envision the role of the private sector in dealing with gender equalities during and after the pandemic? And then, and then a point, um, a question from Yusuf Mahmoud of Tunisia and a, a senior advisor at IPI. Um, we've been talking a lot about studying the, the negative impact of COVID, but we see a lot of examples of women really leading on the ground during COVID, how can we use those experiences as lessons to how to improve participation of women peace builders during uh, this time? So uh, that along with Kavya's question about political will, how to translate rhetorical um, comments to concrete commitments and, and this direct proposal of will people support making women's participation a requirement uh, for uh, UN supported peace um, processes. So quick, quick remarks, uh, final remarks and responses there. Amat, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you so much and apologies for the uh, poor net uh, connection. But I just wanted to continue to uh, where I stopped by mentioning that the Yemeni women are already taking leadership roles, but they need support and little funding, not even that much of funding. Meaningful support and promotion of women's participation in peace building begins with an analysis of local priorities and needs, as well as analysis of the conflict and suggested strategies. This is the only way that the peace process can be consistently brought into line with the actual realities on the ground especially in regards to women's role in peace building. The interlocking crisis we all face will not disappear. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm sure everybody is aware of that as a result of all high level meetings. Only a renewal of our mutual commitment to achieving peace and implementing more urgently and comprehensively the woman peace and security agenda can decisively meet the challenges of our time and we need to trust the woman. The women do not only know what they say because they know what they say, but also they are capable and they know what they are doing. So I would like to stop here. I'm sorry for the interruption. Very good, thank you. Um, in the limited time we have, I'd like to, Sanam, if you don't mind, 
Uh, I'd like to go through the member states first, and if we have time to come come back, we we will. So um, please, let's go to um, to Me um, Mexico. Please, Marco, the floor is yours for any responses and final comments. Thank you very much. I will be uh, very brief. I would like to say some concrete ideas on which I already uh, talked upon uh, before. I think that uh, to encourage priority actions, particularly in conflict and post-conflict settings, is needed to strengthen the collaboration uh, among the UN Department of Peace Operations, the UN Women, the humanita humanitarian agencies, civil society, in particular, the women organizations and networks uh, to enhance the protection of women and girls in response initiatives in the ground. Also, uh, elevate commitments, coordination, and partnerships for the 20th anniversary of the 1325 uh, resolution. Uh, it is also needed to implement public campaigns in conflict and post conflict uh, settings to raise awareness on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic of COVID 19 on women and girls, which uh, the UN Department of uh, Peace Operations could coordinate, indeed, uh, to ensure equal and meaningful women's participation, including young women, in, med in mediation processes. It's very important. We will support this in our participation next year at the uh, Security Council. We have a temporary seat there and we will uh, promote this uh, cessation of hostilities in order to promote national reconciliation. At, uh, on this point, we will explore also the possibility to establish more women mediation networks in different regions, including Latin America, to increase the number of women involved in peace processes, efforts and capacity building initiatives. Great, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. With uh, Given the short amount of time, I'm going to go straight uh, to Sweden to the foreign minister. I know she has to leave, and then hopefully if people can stay, we can stay another couple minutes, and I'd like to hear from DPPA in South Africa and Phnom as well, if possible. Uh, foreign minister, please, your, your final your response. Yeah, thank you very much. And it, it's very interesting to hear and, and the questions and uh, the remarks, for example, from uh, Sanam and from uh, Amat uh, about... Uh, women peace builders and, and what women can do in the peace negotiation. Uh, I think that despite of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the, I have been struck by the fact that women uh, organization continue to mobilize online and, and also using social media and other uh, available tools to communicate, to, to coordinate, to monitor ceasefires, uh, to um, make confidence building measures uh, and other issues. And we work very closely with the different UN envoys to, to make sure that uh, women peace builders are involved in different stages of the process and finding way. And uh, as um, Amat knows very well, but uh, maybe some of you don't know that uh, when we had uh, the negotiations between the parties in the Yemen conflict in Stockholm that led to the Stockholm Agreement, we asked specifically, uh, it was the United Nations led, but we facilitated it from, from, from Sweden, and we asked to get women into the, um, uh, the two um, parties. Uh, we only get one woman in one of the two uh, <laughs> parties, but what we did was to invite a group of women to come to stay at the same uh, kind of, it was kind of a hotel castle uh, far away from, uh, well, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and the women were, were there together with uh, the negotiators from the two sides. So during the meals, the coffee breaks, uh, and everything they could have uh, discussions uh, with the partners. And then uh, uh, I think that that actually meant that their, the, the perspective of women came into it. And we know, all of you know, that uh, there has been uh, so much research done on the sustainability of peace agreement when there are uh, women taking part uh, in, the, uh, in the negotiations. Uh, and I also have to say, it's, it's such a waste of intelligence not to use women. When I was in, in um, Aden uh, in February, I met uh, so many 
women who had IDs, uh, who had a, um, a lot of, of constructive ways of how to go forward in this terrible conflict, and they are kind of not, you know, used in a way that would have been so good for the peace process. And it makes me really frustrated. And that's also why I think that the Women, Peace and Security agenda needs to be pushed. Uh, and all of us, both in the government and in the, um, in the um, uh, civil society uh, and in others, need really to push this issue, not as some little things you do beside with your, as we say, with your left hand, but something that should actually be in the center because it, it gets results. Uh, and it makes uh, a final peace agreement much more sustainable. So unfortunately, I have to run to another bilateral meeting. Uh, so um, thank you for, for, for coming, all of you, and I hope that you, some of you will be able to stay a little bit, even if I, I have to run. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Minister. Really, really appreciate the, the partnership and your, and your comments today. Thank you. Um, Yes, if, if our panelists can stay for a little bit longer, I think there's a couple of issues on the table that I think would merit a further discussion just for maybe five more minutes in particular. I'd like, we, uh, Rosemary DiCarlo had to go, but we do have uh, Assistant Secretary uh, General Miroslav Jenka here who, who is representing DPPA. And I think this question about uh, UN supported peace processes and the ways in which we could make women's participation uh, a requirement or at the center uh, of strategies, as uh, the foreign minister says, is an important one uh, for the UN. And uh, so, um, Mr. Assistant Secretary General, if you could uh, um, give us your your um, comments, I'd appreciate it. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ruppel. Um, uh, I would like to say, uh, first of all, let me start with uh, the fact that just uh, yesterday, uh, 75th session of uh, the General Assembly uh, started. Next week, uh, we will see uh, online, virtually, uh, the leaders uh, of uh, the member states uh, participating in uh, general uh, debate. My point is that it is extremely important now when we start uh, the uh, 75th session of the General Assembly to uh, walk the talk uh, and actually uh, ensure uh, and uh, also create pressure that uh, more women are appointed in leadership positions uh, and uh, consider adopting special temporary measures such as uh, quotas uh, where needed to increase women's participation uh, in decision making. Just uh, following the uh, general debate, uh, you can see how many women are on the screen. I think it will be very interesting test. Second, uh, what I would like to say, and it is about uh, participation, um, meaningful uh, participation in uh, political uh, uh, peace processes, uh, in peace processes in general, but it is not only sitting at the table, it is also participating in the preparation, learning what uh, women uh, think, uh, and also a very important uh, point, implementation of those uh, peace deals. I can only, only agree with several of my uh, predecessors um, uh, in this discussion, you know, when pointing to the fact uh, that uh, we don't see uh, real, uh, meaningful uh, women uh, inclusive participation in uh, the peace uh, processes. We need uh, to uh, change it. Uh, during the weekend, uh, the peace process direct talks uh, between uh, Taliban and uh, representatives of Afghan government uh, started. I think that uh, a lot has been uh, achieved uh, to uh, ensure you know, the rights of girls, of women in Afghanistan. It is extremely important that in these peace talks, uh, women are represented uh, as they uh, deserve. What is uh, UN doing? What is uh, Department for Political and Peace Building uh, Affairs doing? We are trying to include uh, women, not only trying, we are doing it, uh, you know, to be part uh, of our uh, activities. Now, during COVID, it is extremely important to use uh, technology. 
and uh, engage women, for example, also in the debates uh, and sessions of the Security Council and international um, uh, peace forums in order to uh, hear their voice. We are working on uh, gender strategies uh, with uh, countries. Afghanistan is one example, Yemen another, Geneva international discussions uh, on Georgia uh, as well. Let me uh, finish uh, with uh, one thing that uh, the best way to lead uh, is, you know, uh, with uh, showing example. Secretary General Guterres started his term very clearly, uh, making a very big uh, uh, objective of uh, his uh, term to achieve gender parity in leadership uh, positions. We can say now that uh, among all Under Secretaries General and uh, Assistant Secretaries General, half uh, is uh, women. Uh, High-level advisory board on mediation, uh, 12 uh, mem 19 me uh, 18 members, uh, nine women, uh, nine uh, men. And we can continue resident coordinators on the ground uh, who are very important uh, for engaging what was mentioned here also, you know, uh, grassroots, uh, civil society, people, representatives uh, on the ground, uh, you know, in communities, this is extremely important. So more of those, uh, more than half of those resident coordinators are women as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate the concrete examples there. Um, and we'll now turn for final uh, responses and comments from uh, South Africa. Albert, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Lupel. Uh, you, you know, I think it, uh, what, what is key and important um, when we speak about peace, uh, uh, and conflict is that there must be a realization uh, uh, that we should uh, cajole around the, the factors that leads to the prevention of actual violent uh, uh, conflict uh, in the world. Um, and of course, what's key and critical, uh, Dr. Lowell, uh, around uh, the preventative uh, strategies uh, is that we need to construct uh, societies that has uh, security uh, uh, as part of its key characteristics. Uh, so so we, we need to better define what is the role of your non-state actors as midwives towards building a certain and a lasting uh, 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 peaceful world. Uh, I think that is important, in particular, your non-state actors. Uh, because when you don't have the existence of uh, states in certain areas uh, of the world, uh, your NGO, your non-state uh, non actors, it, it plays a key critical role around uh, being midwives of peace. Secondly, uh, our overall approach should take into consideration the well-being of the afflicted societies. So we, we, we need to look at um, how do we put resources available as part of post-peace uh, uh, conflict development process and look at your human development indices, look at sustainable development goals, which evidently is anti-poverty in orientation. And, and thirdly, but not least important, as part of uh, post-peace conflict development, how do we ensure we harness justice for all citizens of the afflicted uh, areas. For example, in South Africa, during the conflict, during the apartheid time, we had what we call your, 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 your truth and uh, reconciliation process, uh, where people would, would be able to talk, where people, as part of the overall mediating and rehabilitation processes, um, and through the peace and uh, your truth and reconciliation processes, we have developed what we call rope, uh, utmost respect for the rule of law. As I conclude, uh, Dr. Lubel, uh, you know, uh, countries that have emerged from violent uh, conflicts may be potential sites of positive change for women. In Africa and elsewhere, women constitute uh, the majority. Women are custodians of cultural values, of practices. Uh, they are the nurturers of our families. And that's why no peace dialogue 
no mediation process, no post plea conflict development dialogue can be successful without the increased participation of women uh, with, with, within the sector. And that is our submission today as South Africa. And we hope that uh, 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 the Institute uh, with, with Sweden will continue to partner with, uh, with your state and non-state actors in this NOVA course. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for those, uh, those comments, reflections. Um, now briefly, uh, Sanam, do you have any, any uh, final thoughts, responses, and uh, just briefly, please. Thank you, yes, um, very quickly. So I wanna make a distinction between the generic call for having women in governmental, et cetera, delegations, because that is not the essence of this. They can have their delegations, but what we are talking about is women who become peace builders from the ground, who are representing the voices of their communities and who are not necessarily on the side of either side. They are on the side of the people. This is not a football game, right? So it is about independent women peace builder delegations that have to be recognized. And that is something that the UN can do tomorrow if they want to. We've done it before, we've had history, we've had precedents, but, and this is my second point, we are plagued with the triple A syndrome of amnesia, ad hocery, and apathy. It's been 20 years. We used to do things differently. Every time we have good practice, it doesn't get built on, it gets forgotten. So we need to shift the triple A syndrome to a triple C syndrome of care, consistency, and commitment. This is where we are. We don't have time to wait around another 20 years to see whether we're gonna have more wars and not. The, the entire Middle East is about to explode. Inclusivity is the answer, is the gateway through which we can begin to rebuild and, and, and have a hope for, uh, for, for peaceful societies. And the UN needs to get on board with us. We love them, we love the UN, but it's gotta get into the 21st century. So thank you for, for, for the time. And, uh, and again, apologies for um, being so frank, but it's urgent. Great, uh, thank you, Sanam. No, that's, uh, that's why we invite you to this forum, because you are frank, of course. Uh, this has been a, a really a rich discussion. If I could take just, just, uh, just one minute here um, to, to thank you all very much for this participation. I think you know, one of the things that we've been talking about quite a bit is this, this need to shift from the normative discussion to something more concrete, and that is, of course, the entire purpose of this forum, of uh, this project with Sweden. We need to shift the balance. It's been 20 years. We're here we are in this anniversary year and we need to focus on implementation um, because it would be, as was said by the foreign minister, a waste of resources um, if we do not think, uh, elevate the participation of women. And this is not just about uh, uh, the, the principle of inclusion, although that's really important, but it's also about removing the barriers to that uh, um, inclusion. Um, that's why it's not enough to just say we, we want to support women. We have to do something because there are so many barriers to that um, participation, um, as I think was, was said by um, the Secretary General and uh, Rosemary De Carlo. We need to push back against the pushback. Um, and this has to include uh, financing. A representative of uh, South Africa had some very detailed uh, proposals on, on that. And it has to have a real whole of system uh, approach. Um, uh, Martha Delgado uh, raised the point about looking at the multilateral system as a whole. This is not just about the Security Council, of course, uh, it is also about the PBC and other elements within the UN system, but it's also about other international organizations. And I think it is a great opportunity to have Sweden uh, coming in at the OSCE at this particular moment and advancing uh, this agenda, but we need to think about how the revitalization of multilateral cooperation writ large in this context of the pandemic can also help to um, advance these issues with concrete action. And, um, you know, listening to Ahmad, of course, uh, was aware of this, but it's always so striking when you hear somebody um, uh, so uh, with such experience that, you know, we can learn, we must learn from the women peace builders on the ground. We can all learn from them who are already doing such brave work um, and deserve our support, our protection, um, as, as Sanam said, it's also, it's not about just grabbing women to represent one side or the other. It's about women who represent their communities and, and are doing the work for peace, not because of, uh, you know, wearing one uh, uniform or another of one side or the other. Um, and um, 
and including them, what that can do, as we've learned, is that including women, it's not just about including women, but women's inclusion represents um, the inclusion of broader elements of society. Um, and, and we've seen that again and again, that, that helps to lead to more effective peace processes and, and peace agreements. Um, so I think we're all here um, in agreement about the fundamentally important nature of this agenda. And all I can say is thank you so much for your participation. IPI is really committed to this uh, with our partners of Sweden to take the next steps forward. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again and, uh, and following up again and again and again. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Take care.